Hello and welcome to In Conversation, the show where we bring you insightful and engaging discussions with experts from various industries. I'm your host, Bongani Mnube, and today our topic is focused on UJ's achievement of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals number one, which is no poverty. The achievement acknowledges UJ's unwavering dedication to finding solutions for the enduring challenge of poverty. You must be asking yourself how UJ did this, who are the people involved, and what does it mean for the institution and the society at large? Well, if you are asking yourself those questions, we are going to be unpacking that with our very special guest. I'm talking about Professor Lauren Graham, the director of the CSDA. I'm talking about the Center for Social Development in Africa. Professor Lauren, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Bongani. Well, before the show, I had to congratulate you and I have to do it again on camera. This is a milestone indeed. Thanks very much. Um, definitely not my own or the center's milestone. It's a university-wide milestone. Um, but I'm very pleased to hear that a lot of the research we've done over the years did go into the portfolio of evidence that was submitted to the Times Higher Education Rankings Committee. Indeed, indeed. And by we, I believe, it's the CSDA. Absolutely. I think that is where our starting point is. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us more about CSDA? What is CSDA? So CSDA is an applied research center, which means that we are grounded in scientific impactful research, but we're also very committed to making sure that that research is applied. So we want to make sure that that research has impact in communities and on policy. We, our research niche is in the field of social development, and we really aim to influence both policy and practice, but also scientific debates in the field of social development. Oh, wow. Interesting. So taking the aims that you have mentioned as the CSDA, how do they align with the United Nations Sustainable Development um, Goals, particularly the number one, which is no poverty? Mm. So I think the field of social development is interested in human development and, and community development progress over time and typically focuses on some of the most pressing challenges. And in South Africa, those challenges are, of course, poverty, inequality, unemployment, for instance. And so our work has traditionally focused on those issues um, for a long time before the Sustainable Development Goals were even announced. But when, when the SDGs were announced by the United Nations, we definitely did run a strategy about how does our research engage with these issues? How do we make sure that our research is relevant to these different goals? So we work very much in SDG 1, no poverty, but also a number of the other ones around, for instance, uh, zero hunger, um, decent work, uh, reduced inequality, um, gender equity. A lot of our work intersects with multiple of those um, sustainable development goals. Wow. Mm -hmm. And out of these goals, which ones have um, UJ achieved in terms of the rankings? Because we recently were rated um, number 46 um, by the, the Times Higher Education uh, mm -hmm. Impact Rankings. So which ones did UJ actually achieve um, in that? So the two where we've performed best are um, goal number one, no poverty, where we were ranked number one globally. It's a remarkable achievement, yes. especially considering that we're a very young university. Um, and the other one, I, if I remember correctly, we ranked number eight globally on decent work, which is SDG eight. Uh -huh. Those were the two where we performed best. Yes. Yeah. Probably what are the projects that you guys were spearheading um, that enabled achieving those, those rankings? So I think a lot of our research has to do with um, looking at existing policy interventions one of which is the child support grant. Uh, the child support grant is an, a, a, a huge poverty alleviation sure. program. It reaches over 12 million children in South Africa. And a lot of our research is focused on how do we amplify the impact of that grant. It's a very small amount of money. Yes. It's supposed to be um, poverty alleviating, but how can we improve the outcomes for children and their caregivers 
um, who are receiving this grant. So we've done multiple different research projects on this, this um, grant. Right. And I'll just give you um, one particular example, and it just demonstrates how we do our research. So a couple of years ago, we did some work in Durenkorp, Soweto, which is, um, if you look at the multiple deprivation index, is one of the most deprived wards in the city of Johannesburg. We did a survey there that looked at how was this grant being used. A couple of things we found there. One is that that grant was being used to pay for things that beneficiaries should have been getting for free, like school uniforms, like basic services. And we worked very closely with an NGO as well as the city of Johannesburg to feed the information back. And um, we, we managed to get the city to agree to automatically ensure that child support grant beneficiaries were registered to receive other basic services. So that meant that the value of the grant um, fully went to the caregiver to use for things like food and other basic necessities. That's one example. Yes. Another example is our Communities of Practice for Child Wellbeing project. Here again, we focus on children who receive the child support grant, and we, we look at them now in the context of the school, in the early grades, so grade R1 and 2. And we work to collect data on those children across a range of wellbeing domains like health, education, psychosocial, care and support, food security, etc., um, and we, we worked with the engineering department to create a child well-being tracking tool. So we collect the data, it then gets transformed, and it's visible to social workers, teachers, community nurses at the school level who are then able to see which children are at risk of poor outcomes. And then they can work together to intervene early on so that that child has access to adequate food, um, that if the caregiver is showing signs of depression, that there's a referral to a social worker, et cetera. Nice. So what we really try to do is, is get into the issue of poverty. We understand the issue of poverty as multidimensional, um, and then figuring out how do we use policy mechanisms and enhance the impact through addressing multiple deprivations uh, that children and caregivers and other community members face. And so that model of working with communities, ensuring that we're, what we're doing is policy relevant, um, I think those are the kinds of things, because in the Times Higher Education Impact Rankings, the, the um, emphasis is on scientific impact. So we do publish in, in international journals, well-ranked journals, but it's also about what is the impact on local communities. And I think we're really cognizant of that relationship. Yes, and I do sense that relationship, as you are saying, that um, the school, you guys were involved in the school, and Dor Dorenkop, as you have mentioned, in Soweto, which is uh, a partnership with the community, and that's research as well, you guys collecting data. So having collected the data, probably um, having recommended, and it contributes to the policy making. Do you guys perhaps follow up to, to, to uh, see the implementations that have been taken, or the policies, maybe if they have been updated, in terms of helping uh, the individuals or eradicate poverty in this case? Yeah, so shifting policy is a difficult thing. And evidence, we, we do certainly try and work closely with departments. Um, we've, we've done some work, for instance, on the national minimum wage with the Department of Employment and Labor, on the family, family policy with the Department of Social Development. So we do certainly try and work closely. But of course, evidence isn't the only thing that influences po um, policy. policy. I think it's also important to think about policy at different levels. So we can work with a national level um, on shifting things like national minimum wage or influencing how we think about the national minimum wage. But where the rubber hits the road is at local government level. And so the work that we often do is actually working in partnership with local government. So in the, the example that I gave of the schools, we work closely with the, the local Department of Social Development. We're working with their social workers. We work closely with the Department of Basic Education where they've got the, the integrated school health program and the support to how do you implement the integrated school um, health program or the care and support services in schools, for instance. Yes. 
Another example is in we work in Orange Farm. We've got a program there that's intended to support young people who are not in employment, education and training to reconnect to learning and earning opportunities. And there we work very closely with the city of Johannesburg's Department of Social Development and our programs actually located at, at their skills center there. So really trying to influence policy at national level, but really importantly to if you want to make policy implementable, you've got to be working at the local level as well. True, and local level for me sounds like charity does begin at home, so we spread from home going outside. So if we can make a difference within the local communities, it can spread out nationally and also to impact other communities. And what I also love is the, the impact that you're giving the places that you've mentioned in those projects, these are poverty-stricken areas. Uh, we're talking townships that are highly dense populated. So that is really interesting to hear. Out of these amazing projects that you've been doing, which one would you say is, um, uh, is your favorite? I know it's big <laughs> of me to ask that, but yeah. Which one has been? Dear oh, to your there's heart? so many that I've, I mean, I think the reason I've, I've, I love working in the centre is because I, I really do see that our projects have impact, um, and it would be difficult for me to say which is my favourite. Yes. Not all of them are run by me. <laughs> <laughs> True. Um, the one that I love working on the most, which is one of uh, uh, one of my projects, is is the basic package of support for young people who are not in employment, education, and training. Yes. That's one that we work um, collaboratively with the University of Cape Town and the DG Murray Trust and a number of other partners. Um, and it's just really rewarding to see how young people's lives shift. Um, but I do think that the, uh, the other project that has very big impact is the Communities of Practice for Child Wellbeing. And to intervene in those early years is crucial. It's crucial. So, yeah, I mean, we've always got exciting new projects innovative new projects. Um, I'm always excited to see what the, what, what the outcomes are of those projects. Mm -hmm. yeah. which, which actually, speaking of that, I, also, I used to do sociology and I noticed that you hold a, a PhD in sociology. Absolutely. So primary socialization is of paramount importance in that case. Yeah. Yes, so um, with, with that, I also wanted to find out the how do you guys identify some of those communities that are poverty stricken, uh, the mechanisms that you guys have, um, the intel, how do you gather the intel so that you're able to go through to the respective places and do your research mm -hmm. and try to make a change? So it depends. Um, we, we definitely try to use um, publicly available survey data. So when we were choosing Dornkop, for instance, we had a look at what are the if we look at the multiple deprivation index where does this where do these communities which are the most deprived communities um so Durancorp, alexandra orange farm are some of the most deprived communities and we we then also look at what are the kind of if we're doing something around the grants for instance where do you have the highest grant uptake so it is based on evidence, but it is also influenced by where we have good partnerships because we want to be working very deliberately in partnership with local NGOs or local government. Um, and so where do we have those good partnerships? And we've, we've managed to develop good partnerships in those communities over a number of years, which is why we continue to work closely in those communities. Um, but that doesn't mean that there aren't opportunities to open up new research in new communities. It just means that there's, there's work that needs to be done to understand that community, to build up partnerships and relationships. True, true. Mm -hmm. And that is indeed. And speaking on, on partnerships, um, I hear most of the partnerships are external. Uh, do you have uh, internal partnerships as well? Really? Absolutely. Yes. So we... We are an interdisciplinary centre, <clears throat> so we, we do have psychologists, demographers, economists, sociologists, social workers on our team, um, and we're very keen to continue working with departments. Um, our, the primary departments we work with are in the Faculty of Humanities, but um, we do also have partnerships outside of the faculty, so the Department of I mean, Education um, is a very close partner on our Communities of Practice project. And then we do also work with partners outside. So I've mentioned UCT on our child well-being project. We also work with the Center of Excellence at WITS, which is, has a much more of a health focus. 
So um, we definitely, partnerships are crucial if you want to tackle something as sticky as poverty. True, true. Mm-hmm. It's indeed that teamwork makes gre- uh, dream work. Yes. That's the saying, teamwork Absolutely. makes dream work. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's literally, we are bearing the fruits of that right now, having to see UJ growing to these heights and uh, over and above all, seeing such an impact, making sure that our country does um, alleviate poverty and having multidisciplinary parties coming together to ensure that we do not have poverty. That is really um, amazing. In terms of your team, I hear that is also quite big from the way you, you're talking. So I just want to find out the members of, of your team, uh, particularly CSDA. Um, do you have, is it made up of students only or lecturers, postgraduates? Um, just the... So we've got 18 staff members. Um, They are, as I said, from a range of different disciplinary backgrounds. We also house the South African, the DST NRF South African Research Chair in Welfare and Social Development, um, Professor Tanusha Raniga, and we also house Distinguished Professor Leila Patel. And then we've got a range of other um, researchers and senior researchers from different backgrounds. In terms of students, we run an interdisciplinary master's program in social policy and development. And um, what we try and do is encourage students when they're doing their dissertation module to connect their research with projects that we're doing. And that has a number of advantages for the students, but it also means that we're able to dig deep into, into particular issues that are coming up in those projects that adds to our knowledge. Um, So we definitely work with students. We do have a couple of research assistants who are, what we try and do is make sure that there are job opportunities for people who are either completing a master's or pursuing a doctorate. So they would be part-time positions so that you've got an income, but you also are able to pursue your postgraduate studies. Wow. That is indeed amazing. I I like um, the fact that there is that combination of a project, a student's dissertation, and it is aligned to actually making actual change and contributing to to uh, eradicating poverty and mm-hmm. other societal issues, which is quite amazing. Um, do you perhaps have volunteers as, uh, as well in the uh, NCSD? We haven't worked closely with volunteers before, mm-hmm. mainly because of the, you know, if you want to have, if a volunteer ha- would have a good experience, they yes. need to be well managed. Um, and I think we would struggle with that management capacity. What we do do is if we've got a very um, intense field work process going on, whether that's household surveys or whether that's interviews, we would typically try and involve or invite students to be involved in that so that they're getting some research experience. That is amazing yeah. as well. But that would be a paid opportunity. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. I think I should be knocking on your doors as well <laughs> to, <laughs> to expand the impact. Um, thank you so much, Prof. Um, so where to from now with the CSD and uh, the objectives that you guys have right now? So I think some of the future directions are are really thinking about scale. So we we've we've got a couple of really innovative social development interventions, um, but we've tested them on a small scale. So I think what we the kind of next steps that we need to be thinking about is is how do we begin to scale those up? How do you and and working with um, NGOs and and government around how do you scale up? evidence-based innovative social development intervention. So I'd say that's one of the areas. The other area that's really emerging for us off the back of the Communities of Practice project where we had the child wellbeing tracking tool is thinking about technology for development. Um, where, where is technology useful for development? Where is it a barrier? Um, what do we need to do to be um, really addressing the issues of of development using technology and how does that work well and where does it not work well. So we're going to be hosting a webinar later in the year where we'll be looking at technology for development, bringing some of our international partners to talk and also just talking about our experiences with the projects where we're testing tech in development. That sounds like reimagining the future or the future Mm -hmm. reimagined. Indeed, technology is in our midst and finding these new ways of um, dealing with African problems and coming up with solutions for African people in this technologically changing environment is indeed um, something to to work towards. And I'm super excited that 
um, the CSD amongst um, the other partners and they are contributing to a, an amazing change in society and we appreciate you for that we also appreciate for the world recognizing that and i believe that gives more drive and more zeal and encourages more partners to come in and to contribute in in making the change in society so for that i'd like to thank you so much prof thank you very much <laughs> Thank you so much. I'd like to also open the platform for you. You know, if there is anything you want to add um, in our discussion. Mm. I do think one of the things that we need to recognize about the university and, and when I was looking at how does the Times Higher Education Impact Rankings work for this SDG 1, one of the things that they take into consideration is whether the university has put into place mechanisms that promote access to higher education for students from disadvantaged backgrounds. And I really do think that, that the contribution that UJ has made here has, has added to, to the rankings. So uh, as far as I remember from my reading of this, over 60% of our students benefit from the missing middle fund. Um, just under a third of our students come from the poorest schools um, in South Africa, Quintal 1 and 2 schools. And I think the, the efforts that have gone into ensuring that, that students from disadvantaged backgrounds have access to higher education is something that can't be underestimated in our achievements in the impact rankings. True, true. Yeah. And also to add on that, uh, check on Ulink. UJ has a tab for Bazari Hub. So it's also assisting students to ensure that they do access education. They have funding, which is an, ama which is an amazing milestone. It adds to the societal impact that we are actually talking about today. Mm -hmm. So with that, I again thank you. We are super grateful and super proud of the impact that has been inflicted onto our society. And we hope that you guys continue to do more. We also hope to assist where possible to make sure that that um, transformation and uh, it is evident in society. Great, thank you so much. Pleasure. Well, there you have it, dear viewers, and thank you so much for tuning in. We got to find out more about the works of the CSDA and um, the rankings that recently came out that UJ has been ranked on the top spot uh, in terms of uh, implementing SDG1. How amazing is that? Well, that is all for today. We'll see you on the next one. The University of Johannesburg, the future reimagined.